All right. Well, welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us on this absolutely glorious spring day for today's Lunch and Learn, Portland by the Foot. We are taking a virtual tour of Portland today, focusing on the Black and female figures who made history there. Our guide today is Dugan Murphy, local historian and founder of Portland by the Foot. He's going to take us past local landmarks that we have all probably passed a million times, as well as some spots off the beaten path. And we will have an inclusive, empowering, and surprising constellation of tales to leave us all wondering what else has been left out of the history books. My name is Kathleen Neal. I am the Director of Policy and Partnerships here at Maine Conservation Voters and Maine Conservation Alliance. Our organizations represent more than 13,000 members and supporters dedicated to protecting Maine's environment and our democracy. MCA does that through education, collaboration, and advocacy. And MCV by influencing public policy, holding politicians accountable, and winning elections. Uh, Abby, you wanna advance those slides? and we will share a few technical notes for today's event. We will hear from Dugan and take a little tour and then do questions and answers towards the end. You don't have to wait though, you can send those questions to me through the chat whenever they occur to you and I will keep track and ask them of Dugan in the session at the end. We ask that you not message Dugan directly as we want him to be able to focus on the tour. Uh, if you do have any technical difficulties today, you can message Abby Bradford and she will help you out. This event is being recorded and the video will be posted on our website later this afternoon, where you can also find recordings of all of our previous Lunch and Learns. Thanks again for joining us and Dugan, I will turn it over to you. London. Uh, let's, uh, I'll just share my screen for you. So you can all see it too. There we go. Uh, no, I, I, some of you might've got a little glimpse of my cat there, not part of the presentation. Um, this is me, Dugan Murphy. I am the founder of a walking tour company called Portland by the Foot. And this is our first season. We just started in April doing tours. But I have a background as a tour guide in Portland. So I've given tours for about 24,000 people, a little over 24,000 people. So I have a little bit of experience before starting this company. And this presentation today is very much like a virtual walking tour in that where I'm going to be telling stories, but they're very much based in the buildings and landscapes of Portland. So we're going to jump around and uh, find locations and then find some stories that are behind some of these spaces that you've probably been to before. Let's get acquainted first with Portland. <clears throat> this is a map or bird's eye view of Portland as it was in 1876. And really, it hasn't changed too much since then. Uh, Parkside, West End, um, the Western Promenade specifically, and Munjoy Hill have developed a little more since then, but you know, this is pretty much the same. You got 295 and whatever. I'm using this because I was looking for an image like this of modern day Portland, and they all have watermarks. And I wasn't able to afford those photos, so I figured, why not? 1876. We all know where we are, right? Got Munjoy Hill, that's in the east end, that's to your right. You got the West End over there on the left. That's Bram Hall Hill that West End is built upon. And the most famous part of town for visitors, the old port down there on the waterfront, basically in the middle between the East End and West End. And let's pick out a building and get started. I'm interested in this one. Let's look at it here. We're talking about the first parish church. Probably noticed it before. It's the oldest church building in the city, and it's the oldest religious organization in the city. Uh, but the building you're looking at is from 1825. That's not when the congregation was founded. The congregation goes back to 1674. They've been on this property since 1740. And this is the wooden building that predates the 1825 stone building today. 
this wooden structure is called Old Jerusalem. It was there uh, from 1740 until 1825 when they built the current building. This is the building that was standing in 1775, October of that year, when a Captain Henry Mowat of the British Navy arrived in our harbor, three ships pointed the cannons at the city of Portland. We called it Falmouth back then, and it was a town, and spent eight hours blasting this town with red hot cannonballs and uh, exploding incendiary devices and managed to um, burn about 40% of the town that way. But he also is very successful by sending soldiers ashore with torches. So these soldiers come up to the buildings and they're lighting them on fire. The ones that weren't already blasted apart with cannonballs and uh, flaming because of the incendiary devices. The soldiers get to this first parish church and they're about to light it on fire. This is arguably, at the time, the most important building in the city, because we're talking about not a church, a meeting house. This is the center of religious power and political power in this theocratic, uh, traditionally Puritan community. The minister of the church is also effectively the mayor and is paid from the town budget. So when the soldiers get to this building, they're met with one person who is guarding this church. And it's a black enslaved man named Mayberry, who was not even a Portlander. He was from Gorham, but he was in town that day protecting this building. And when he encountered those British soldiers, he sent them to uh, these influential loyalists in town. Keep in mind, Portland at the time was largely a loyalist community. The reason we burned down is because of Brunswick. If there are any of you here from Brunswick, great. Thank you very much. <laughs> it was the Brunswick militia, Patriot militia. They stirred up trouble with the British and caused this trouble. But the most influential people in town, they were loyal to the king. They argued with the soldiers and the soldiers left the first parish alone. But it was only because they were apprehended by the that enslaved man named Mayberry. So they're gone, that's the soldiers leaving. Like I mentioned though, 40% of the buildings were destroyed that day. And Captain Mowat said in his log, I left the town in one column of flame. He was really proud of the, the conflagration he had created. Conflagration being not just a fire, but it's so big and so hot, it creates its own climate down there. Now this fire was nationally famous. The Revolutionary War was on, we were a few months into the struggle, and then the few months later, July 4th, 1776, we get this document that looks very familiar to most of you, the Declaration of Independence. But this document, most people don't really bother reading past the introduction and the preamble, that's the poetic part that we learn about in school. Most of the document is a list of grievances, and you can see that most of those sentences that are indented on the left, it says he this, he that. Now, if we're going to look at these grievances, we go down to grievance number 24. And it says, I'll read it for you. He has plundered our seas, ravaged our coasts, burnt our towns, and destroyed the lives of our people. That phrase, burnt our towns, that is us. That is a direct reference to Portland, Falmouth at the time and Charlestown, Massachusetts, which were both burned by the British in the months preceding this document. This is Portland's place on the Declaration of Independence, and I want you to appreciate that as mostly local people, as I imagine most of you are on this call. Now, this document is considered the founding document of the United States, and that's why we celebrate Independence Day on the 4th of July. That means, that on the 19th of July, 1776, this country was exactly 15 days old when the United States signed its very first treaty with another nation. That treaty is the Treaty of Alliance and Friendship. This is the document. Very first time another nation recognized the United States and furthermore expressed their solidarity with the United States in the fight against the King of England. 
Now, we all know about France. They came in late. They ended the war because they were such a major power. But the first people to the door, that's the Mi'kmaq, Maliseet, and Passamaquoddy tribes of Maine, New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, and Quebec. You're looking here at an annual commemoration of this treaty, which is still in effect today. It has been ever since the 19th of July, 1776. This is 2018, shortly before the pandemic. And we got representatives from those indigenous nations down there uh, celebrating with local um, people in Watertown, Massachusetts. It's also known as the Treaty of Watertown. Uh, that's the um, American name for this treaty, but the indigenous uh, members of that treaty, they call it the Treaty of Alliance and Friendship. And if anybody is a member of one of those tribes, but also a Canadian citizen, as many of them are, they can join the US military just like a US citizen can because this treaty is still in effect. It's an international treaty between sovereign nations. These uh, tribes that I just mentioned, Mi'kmaq, Maliseet, Passamaquoddy, three of the four federally recognized sovereign indigenous nations in Maine. Uh, we also have here um, Penobscot. Uh, Abenaki people are considered part of the Wabanaki Confederacy. Uh, they do not yet have federal recognition. Now, these folks have skillfully navigated diplomatic relationships with first the Portuguese, the first uh, people to, from Europe to come to these shores, didn't set up permanent settlements, but the French did. They, maintain diplomatic relationships with the French. Later, the English did, and they're diplomatically uh, relating to the English. Later, we've got the United States and the state of Maine, the descendant institutions of those English colonizers. For hundreds of years, they have maintained their sovereignty and they have uh, managed to maintain relationships with these uh, colonizing entities. Where I am giving this tour right now, I am standing on unceded Wabanaki land. Wabanaki being that collective term for all of these indigenous nations. Uh, so I'm giving this tour in their honor, uh, a place that traditionally is called Machigan and a larger, that's Portland, more or less the peninsula of Portland, within a larger land mass we call Wabanaki. Nowadays, most people call this Portland within Maine. Uh, this here is Molly and Dana. She is the official diplomat for the Penobscot Nation, one of those four federally recognized independent Wabanaki nations. They, these nations are to this day fighting for land rights, water rights, and political sovereignty. In the US Supreme Court, which very recently had a decision affecting the Penobscot's sovereignty, on their island in the Penobscot River, their namesake river. And there is a bill being debated right now at the State House that will affect the level of sovereignty these indigenous nations have. So we're talking about one of the oldest stories on this tour and also the most current event on this tour when we're talking about uh, indigenous people here in Maine. Now we've been, this is all related to the First Parish Church somehow, if you believe me. Let's head back to the map. We need to stay geographically relevant here. Uh, we talked about the first parish church. Let's head to another church, one that is only three years younger, and that is um, almost on Munjoy Hill. We'd consider it part of the India Street neighborhood today, or somebody might say the East End area of town. And uh, let's check it out. We're talking about the Abyssinian Meeting House. This is Maine's oldest black church. It is the third oldest black church in the entire country. But notice the banner, Abyssinian Meeting House. Like its contemporary in the center city, the first parish, this is not just a church for religious services. It's a meeting house. This is where um, all sorts of events took place over generations. The center of the black community in Portland in the 19th century. And there are so many stories related to this church. I could hang out here all day. Um, and we do go here on, on the Black History Tour that I do. But I'll bring up one figure, and that's Charles Frederick Eastman, this guy right here. If you're only going to pick one person to represent 
19th century Black Portlanders, he's a really great example because he had all of the jobs that Black Portlanders specialized in back then. I mean, you see all sorts of different jobs, but um, the predominant industries he's representing, he was a hack driver, and that's a person who drives a taxi cab, but it's a horse and carriage. He was a secondhand clothing dealer. He was a mariner. He was a barber. Uh, he engaged in real estate development. These are all the kinds of things that 19th century Black Portlanders really specialized in. He, in particular, ended up specializing in barbering. He created a barbering dynasty. And uh, these uh, members of the Eastman family are still around across New England today. He had lots of barber shops, had lots of kids, trained them to run those barber shops. They had lots of kids, et cetera. Uh, but this guy actually lived two doors down from the Abyssinian meeting house on the corner of Mountford Street. He was the church clerk. He was a major benefactor of the church, probably Portland's wealthiest black citizen in the day. He booked the abolitionist speakers who would speak at the Abyssinian meeting house, because like I said, not just church services, but political events, uh, anti-slavery, um, activist events, celebrations, all sorts of things. And like I mentioned, this Eastman family, pretty big. His granddaughter grew up in a house that he built on Anderson Street in uh, what we now call East Bayside. And this woman has an interesting history around uh, the time of World War II. So we're getting into the 20th century now. Flossie Eastman Williams. And that's the woman on the right, by the way. She's posting here with her sisters. We don't have a great picture of just Flossie. Uh, so the woman on the right, right here, who volunteered at an organization called the Colored Community Center for Servicemen. This is a USO that was started by local Black Portlanders to address the needs of visiting Black soldiers during World War II at a time when the Black population in Portland went from about 325 to about 1,500 just during those war years. And the military provided a USO only for the white soldiers. And so the local Black Portlanders had to work together to start their own. It was originally the Colored Community Center for Servicemen. It was renamed after this woman, Marian Anderson. It became the Marian Anderson USO. And we're talking about a nationally renowned gospel singer, opera singer. Tuscanini said that she had a voice that you hear once in a hundred years, also a civil rights icon. She came to Port Portland to perform a number of times. And this is her at the rededication of that USO uh, being given a, a bouquet of flowers here uh, to recognize her performances here. Uh, David Dixon, by the way, is the guy who was most instrumental in starting this operation that was on center street <clears throat> just behind monument square and david dixon he worked as a uh, he was a jamaican immigrant who lived in a house on Munjoy hill still there to this day he worked as a janitor downtown but back to flossy flossy was not just a volunteer at the uso she was also a sought after clairvoyant people in the neighborhood would come to flossy for advice on things to do in their life because she had these predictions of the future that all too often played out. Most famously, she was with her daughter, June McKenzie, who's still around today. And she said to her daughter, you have to go to your father right now, he's in trouble. She had this vision that her husband, June's father, was in danger of burning because he was uh, working on a truck and uh, he was a tr truck driver and he, she envisioned the truck catching on fire and him crawling through the window of the cab to escape. When June got to him, he was crawling out the window of the cab of his truck to escape the fire that was consuming his truck. Crazy, right? This is US history here. <laughs> I can't deny the facts. Um, now, another member of this family, just to bring it up to the current day, Bob Green, some of you may be familiar with him. He's around today. Uh, he is a historian and a journalist. Some of the history that I tell on my tours comes from this guy. I believe he's the great grandson of Charles Frederick Eastman, maybe great, great grandson. 
He's also related to uh, another guy, Ruben Ruby, comes up and is basically the number one star of the uh, Portland Black History Tour. So just looking at three figures here, we got three centuries of Black history in Portland represented. We're looking at a community that has always been in the minority in Portland and in Maine, and sometimes fairly small minority. And yet the history runs very deep, much deeper than Charles Frederick Eastman. We're just scratching the surface. Uh, my my uh, two hour tour just on this topic gets into it in way more detail, but let's leave the Abyssinian behind. Let's head back to the map. So we've checked out a couple of churches and we've been in the center of town on the east end of town. Let's check out the west end of town. We've got a building over here on Brackett Street on the west end. If you've been over there, you've probably noticed it before. Um, this is where Fresh Approach has their storefront. Anybody who's been around for more than a few decades might remember this building being called the People's Building. I think some people still call it the People's Building today. In 1836, however, this was the Brackett Street School. And this woman, as a little girl, we don't have a picture of her as a little girl. Imagine her as a little girl. She was going to school here, Ellen Gould Harmon. Later, Ellen Gould White. She was nine years old when a classmate threw a rock at her face and she was knocked unconscious. She was unconscious for three weeks but then she fully regained consciousness and the full use of her body. But later on in life, she began seeing visions. Over the course of her life, she experienced 2,000 visions, uh, oftentimes before audiences. And she attributed a deep religious meaning to these visions. And she became a co-founder of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. She is to this day the most translated nonfiction author in American history. You could also say she is the most translated female nonfiction author in world history. So a woman with a major impact uh, and she has part of her origin story right here on the West End. A little building you probably pass by all the time and don't really think much about. Heading back to the map, uh, let's see, let's check out a little building over here in Bayside. We haven't been in Bayside yet. That happens to be Portland High School. This is a postcard from about 100 years ago, but it looks pretty much the same today. And it looked about this way back in the 1940s when this guy was a high school student there. This is Ted Lowry, who as a boxer, as you can tell, he, among other things, got into boxing. And he took on the name Tiger Ted Lowry. As a high school student here in Portland at Portland High School, he was invited to compete in a boxing competition for amateurs. He met with his first opponent, knocked him out. He went up against a second opponent and he knocked him out. He went up against a third opponent at this competition and he knocked him out. The fourth person who was on deck looked at the three men who he had knocked out before him, boys really, we're talking about teenagers, uh, and that fourth guy left. He opted out. He didn't want to go up against Tiger Ted Lowry. So he felt like he had something uh, that might work out for him, and he got into boxing. But concurrently with that, he also served in World War II. He is a paratrooper who was working or um, serving in the Pacific Northwest. Now, why did the US military need, para, uh, need paratroopers in the Pacific Northwest during World War II. Well, it happened to be that, and this was a state secret for generations. I don't think it was until the 90s that it came out that the Japanese military were sending incendiary balloons into the Pacific Northwest. They were dropping incendiary bombs and lighting forest fires. So paratroopers like Ted Lowry were dropping out of planes fighting these fires in the Pacific Northwest. A part of World War II, we weren't even able to know about until he uh, was elder, an elderly man. He also was serving in Texas at a, a military base. There were lots of um, German POWs at this 
uh, military base. Every so often they'd ride a bus into town, get cigarettes, get some food or whatever. Uh, he might be riding a bus with Nazi POWs, he and his buddies, US soldiers. And I think you can guess who gets to sit in the front and who gets to sit in the back. How demeaning is that? Nazis are sitting in the front row and he has to sit in the back because he's a black man. Now, it's not just military. Let's go back to him as a boxer. He went up against a guy named Rocky Marciano. Uh, many consider him the greatest boxer of the 20th century. He went up against, the two of them went up against each other a number of times. And Tiger Ted Lowry is the only boxer to go a full 10 rounds against Rocky Marciano. When you go all the way through the rounds as a boxer, nobody's knocked out. That's when the judges need to make a, a call on who the winner is. Two times, Tiger Ted Lowry really feels like he was actually the winner. And the only reason he wasn't declared the winner was because the judges would have felt like they were going out on a limb, picking this lesser known black man as the winner up against the favorite, the guy everybody expected to win, who would have been Rocky Marciano. Whew, that's Portland High School. Let's go back to the map, folks. We got a couple more we want to go into. Let's head over to Longfellow Square, uh, the western end of the Arts District. If we're zooming in, we got a house here you might have passed by before. This fairly simple granite facade is the home of John Neal. This is him when he's about 29 years old. He lived in that house until uh, he was in his late 80s when he passed away. This is him at 82. I don't know if you heard about this guy before, but he is Portland's first international celebrity from Portland, way before Longfellow was famous. He was America's first women's rights lecturer. He was the first writer to use the phrase son of a bitch in a work of fiction. He invented what he called natural writing or talking on paper, which in simple terms, using natural diction in your writing, basically the basis for American literature as it later developed in the 19th century. The first author to write in stream of consciousness style narrative, the first writer to use psychotherapy as a foundation for a story, the first American published in the British literary journals. He also wrote the first novel about the Salem witch trials. He happens to be also the person who, uh, the first American to open a public gymnasium in the United States. Uh, this is Maine's first gymnasium. He's also opened up gymnasiums at Bowdoin College, one down to Saco. He's America's first literary critic and the first, uh, the first art critic, first literary critic to sponsor or praise Edgar Allan Poe, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, John Greenleaf Whittier, Nathaniel Hawthorne. And man, if you're looking at this list and thinking, why don't I know about this guy? Um, that's what I've been asking too. I'm working on a book about him, Stay in Touch. I think within a year or so, I'll have a book out about him. He's a really interesting guy. One more I'll offer. Number 12. He is the first lawyer to introduce expert medical witness testimony into a U.S. court of law. And I know what you're thinking. That's odd. Like, what does that really mean? He, you could also say, he was the first lawyer to seek leniency from a jury for a defendant on account of mental defect. Who is this defendant? A nine-year-old boy from Durham accused of assault and maiming. And what was his reasoning? Well, you can't really tell from this plaster cast of his head that John Neal had made, but there's a bump over his ear. And if you're a fan of phrenology, a form of 19th century medical quackery, you would say that his organ of destructiveness was inflamed. And this may have caused him to... Uh, become violent against other children. And that's Portland's place in the history of US law. Let's head back to the map. What about South Portland? Because that's not even on the map. And yet, there's lots of cool stuff down there. We're talking about the other side of the harbor right down there. Let's take a little view. Uh, here's the campus of the Southern Maine Community College a really beautiful college campus, probably one of the most beautiful in the country. It's got its own lighthouse. That's right there, Spring Point Ledge Light. Let's get another view. That's the same lighthouse you're seeing in this picture here. Otherwise, a picture of James Alloyd Johnson. 
This is the guy who founded Southern Maine Community College. He was a high school, Portland High School graduate, 1928. So another Portland High School graduate for this tour. He became a medical engineer at a Boston Navy Yard during World War II. And when that war was over, he was dismayed at how few economic opportunities these soldiers had these returning World War II soldiers, um, what kind of economic opportunities they had presented to them. Uh, so he decided to start a college to teach them marketable skills. Now he was already an auto mechanic. So he got together with a carpenter, an electrician and a plumber. And he started that college in Augusta, later moved down to South Portland. This guy holds tons of patents, he wrote a lot of books about auto mechanics that were standards in the industry for decades. And in his spare time, he built this car from scratch. That's why this is a very important photo for understanding James Alloy Johnson. This is a car that he built in his garage by hand over the course of 20 years between 1948 and 1968. And his daughter shares fond memories of going back there into the garage on the weekend and being like, Hey, Dad, like, how you doing? You going to come in for dinner? And he'd be like, hey, give me that wrench. Because <laughs> he's building a car from scratch. Uh, and this is him, I think, shortly after he finished it in the late 60s. Now, with all of these achievements, you might be surprised to know that the last great achievement he had at 75 years old was he got a bachelor's degree. He is the founder of a college. And he didn't have a college degree until he was 75. Who needs one, right? If you're already the holder of so many patents and a successful inventor. But he did end up getting a bachelor's degree anyway. Uh, that's a, a degree in trade and industrial design that he achieved at 75 years old. And it's now in South Portland. I'd like to leave you today. Uh, thank you so much for joining our tour of Portland. I hope you enjoyed it and that it generated a few questions. Uh, that I would be really happy to answer. Of course, this is just barely scratching the surface of uh, interesting women uh, from Portland, uh, the Black history in Portland, and lots of other topics that we cover on three different tours that I do of Portland. They're all two-hour walking tours of Portland. So um, I'd be happy to take you on a tour. Also be happy to answer your questions right now on Zoom. Yugen, this was so much fun. Thank you. You know, I confess, when I think about a, a virtual tour via Zoom, I didn't know exactly, you know, you don't know what, you, what you're going to get, but wow, that was incredible. And uh, everybody, we will include the link to Portland by the Foot in this, uh, this afternoon's follow-up email. I know I definitely want to connect about some tours this summer, Dugan. That was just so much fun. And I want to I want to take all of them. So see you all there in, in person. Uh, I also just want to share with everybody, Dugan donates a portion of the tour proceeds to the Obsidian Meeting House. We're going to share some information about uh, about that, the both the the meeting house and the organization that has formed to help restore and support it because I want to want to join you in that support Dugan so look for all of that in this afternoon's follow-up email and the very first question is uh can you tell us the names of the phenomenal folks that you you talked to because I didn't get it down fast enough and I see that there are a couple of people who are are curious about it Sure. So you're just talking about who are, what are the names of the people that I brought yes, up? Yes, exactly. Okay, sure. Uh, I have notes, and so I should be able to pretty easily get you a list of names. Let's see. I think the first name that I mentioned was the enslaved man who saved the first parish church. That's a man named Mayberry. There is very little information about him in the world, and I would, that's the case for enslaved people in uh, New England in general very little information and um, what research we have is is, uh, is is just scratching the surface. Um, let's see, the next name of a particular person would have been Molly and Dana. That's the a diplomat for Penobscot Nation. When we got to the Abyssinian Meeting House, I mentioned Charles Frederick Eastman, uh, his granddaughter Flossie Eastman Williams, and then uh, Bob Green 
who might be his great, great grandson, I believe. Um, and I also mentioned Marian Anderson of the Marian Anderson USO here in Portland. David Dixon uh, came up uh, just briefly. He's the founder of that USO. On the West End, the People's Building, the Brackett Street School, that was a person named, uh, better known as Ellen Gould White. When she was a little girl here, she was Ellen Gould Harmon, but Ellen Gould White is how she's known in adulthood. The boxer, that's Tiger Ted Lowry. Uh, I mentioned one of his opponents, Rocky Marciano, otherwise doesn't have anything to do with Portland. John Neal, uh, the guy I'm writing a book about who has that huge list of superlatives. And I think, it, yeah. And then I went from there to James Alloyd Johnson. Uh, sometimes Jim Johnson, sometimes Lloyd Johnson. His middle name is A-L-L-O-Y-D, which I feel like is a pretty appropriate name for a mechanical engineer. It sounds like alloy, but it's alloyed. It's like Lloyd, but with an A on the, on the front. Anyway, that's him, James Alloy Johnson. I think that's everybody. Thank you so much. I, that is really helpful. I have walked up and down Neal Street a million times without knowing the story of John Neal. Uh, so I can't wait to read your book. And I, I remember writing a book report or something about Marian Anderson as a kid. And uh, I didn't realize that there was a Portland connection. I, so thank you. I, that's really helpful. Um, do you ever touch on some of the, the conservation history in Portland, like the Baxter family or anything like that? Is that in any of your tours? The littlest bit. Okay. Uh, but first, actually, I'll mention, because you mentioned Neal Street, coincidentally, there's a Neal Street and a Dow Street, which some people think both of them are named for Neil Dow, or maybe Dow Street's named for Neil Dow and Neal Street's named for John Neal. None of those the case. <laughs> Fun fact, Neal Street is named for John Neal's uncle, Stephen Neal. Dow Street is named for Neal Dow's father, Josiah Dow. Both of them having owned land in the West End, and that's entirely why they're named after them. Okay. Otherwise, we don't really hear much history about them. So, Dugan, how do you know all of this? <laughs> I, you know, it's wow. something I'm interested in. Uh, if you talk to an auto mechanic, if I talk to an auto mechanic, I'm always immensely surprised at how much information and knowledge they have about how cars work, because I don't know a damn thing about how cars work. Um, and so when people ask me, like, well, how do you know all this about history? And I'm like, it just, just happens to be this, this thing that I'm into. So. Um, and I call myself a historian, but mostly what I'm doing is reading research from actual historians. I'm more of a public historian, meaning that I'm refining stuff, research that other people have done, original research other people have done, and then making it into something presentable that uh, uh, people who aren't in academia uh, can understand. Though sometimes I do have to do a little bit of original research to get into the lesser known stories or uh, the actual locations of something that people know the story of, but I'm a tour guide, so I want to know where it happened, and I have to go into uh, old documents to find some of that information. Uh, but you asked about conservation and the Baxter family. Uh, interestingly enough, the Baxter family comes up most on the women's history tour, and that's more because of James Finney Baxter's wife, Mahedable Cummings Baxter, who happens to be the best first name that comes up in any one of my tours, Mahedable. <laughs> Uh, she's the founder of the Portland Society of Art, which is now the basis for the Portland Museum of Women. Uh, and so for context, I'll, I'll sometimes describe the legacy of the Baxter family, especially for people from away who are like, oh, okay, he's the wife of who? <laughs> and I'm like, oh, well, let me give you a little bit of context of the Baxter family, just so you know who I'm talking about. I, I love that. And say her name again, Mahedable? Mahedable. Okay. Oh, and also... Uh, Percy Baxter comes up on the Women's History Tour because he was instrumental in having the uh, amendment to the United States Constitution ratified here, the one that um, granted women's suffrage to Mainers. All right. You, you said you're mostly reading um, historian, you know, published research and that sort of thing. So do you have any favorites for, for Portland history or Maine history? Sure. So um, if I only had one thing to recommend for 
black history in Maine, it would definitely be a book called Maine's Visible Black History, which is authored slash edited by Gerald E. Talbot and H. H. Price. Though the, there's tons and tons of contributors, including Bob Green contributes another number of pieces. Uh, for the women's history, it's all over the map. But one book that really uh, amazed me was a book that came out just a couple years ago called Voting Down the Rose. And I can't remember the author now, but if you look it up, I'm sure you'll find it, Voting Down the Rose. It's ostensibly a biography of Florence Brooks Whitehouse, who was instrumental in uh, the last few years, maybe the last decade or so, of the women's suffrage movement, both nationally and in Maine. She lived in Portland on a house on Bond Street that's still there today. But uh, her, this book about her is also very much a play-by-play -play history of those last few years of the women's suffrage movement and so valuable to a tour guide because it tells you where this meeting happened, where they had the headquarters for this campaign or that campaign. Um, that kind of locational information is like super valuable <laughs> to our tour guide. Um, but it's really interesting hearing the play by play uh, in that book. And I, I like that one a lot. Thank you. And just so everybody knows, I'm going to Google those, uh, those books just as soon as we are finished with today's Lunch and Learn. And I will put links to those into that follow up email for this afternoon so you can, can look them up. Uh, and then Dugan, you, you, you've hinted at this a little bit. There's clearly something different about telling the story of, of a city when you're just sitting around versus when you're out on the streets. How do you decide what you want to focus on? I mean, if there's not a good location, does the story not get told? Or, or just take us behind the curtain a little bit. How do you plan a tour? Yeah, so that you're, you're, we're talking about right now my winter of 2021 to 2022, which was doing a hell of a lot of reading, taking a lot of notes, and then I did some spatial analysis. <laughs> I have a academic background in urban and community planning certificate in geographic information science. And um, so if anybody's, actually conservation people are probably familiar with GIS through um, uh, uh, environmental usage. Um, for me, Spatial analysis means, uh, in this case, every story that I want to tell, there's probably at least one or two landmarks somewhere on the peninsula that it's relevant to, where that person lived, where a crucial meeting happened, something like that. And basically what I did for these three tours was I just came up with all the stories I wanted to tell. I put dots on the map where those stories could reasonably be told. And then I drew a line of best fit that captured as many of those spots as possible. That's that's the short version of that story. That is fascinating. And I, I have to say, I have not heard GIS data used in that way. I love it. I love it. Uh, do all of your tours start in the same place? Or do you do you decide make that decision based on where all those little dots end up on the map? The second choice. Uh, though they do start close to each other. So the Hidden Histories Tour starts in Post Office Park in the middle of the old port. The Women's History Tour starts just two blocks away on, uh, in front of City Hall. And then the uh, Black History Tour starts just two doors down from that at the First Parish Church. Uh, and then the routes are slightly different because the Women's History um, landmarks are generally west of there. So they're basically mostly along Congress Street we take it up the park side a little bit into the West End a little bit, but mostly it's a tour of the arts district. Whereas the Black History Tour, uh, most of those landmarks are in the old port and then a little bit east of center. So we climb up Munjoy Hill a little bit. And then the Hidden Histories Tour, uh, that one stays, spends most of its time on the waterfront. So we do spend a little bit of time on Congress Street. We spend a lot of time on the, on the waterfront, Commercial Street, Wharf Street, Fourth Street area. We're all going to find this out for ourselves soon enough. I have a feeling you're going to get a little a little lunch and learn bump here. Uh, but I'm curious about you said, did you say how many people have you taken on tours yet? I mean, already. <laughs> uh, so I'm uh, I'm a real record keeper. And um, when I used to work on the dock boat here in Portland um, and uh, I've been working for them since 2018 and 
they get really busy in the summertime. In July and August, they'll do six tours a day for 35 or 36 people on that tour. And I was taking notes for the years that I'd been working for them when I started this company. I was like, I wonder how many tourists have actually heard me speak before. And I totaled up all those numbers and I got just over 24,000, which I believe that's just slightly bigger than Auburn, Maine, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> I think it would be maybe the fifth largest city in Maine if all those tourists landed here and founded a new city. I love that. That is terrific. And thank you for explaining. I was I thought 24,000 was stuck in my head and I thought you also said Portland by the foot just got started. You've had a very busy spring, but okay. So who is, we're going to put aside the duck tours for a second, because I have a feeling that might be a slightly different, different audience. Who is signing up for your tours? Who's joining you for these adventures? And what, what are the best questions that you're getting? Right. So um, yeah, it's really been interesting to see. We had a soft opening in March and I was only marketing to local people and kind of marketing it as this is a soft open. I'm still kind of testing things out. Uh, you know, it's like a community night at a Portland Stage Company where they say the actor might call for a line at any moment. Um, and then starting in April, I had done each tour enough that now I started promoting it to uh, uh, guests from away, tourists. Um, so really I'm about a month and a half into like the business if you don't include the kind of test tours in March, which are just on the weekends. So obviously March, all local. April, May, it's been a mix. And um, I'm finding that locals tend to be more interested in the women's history tour. Um, that that um, it's also been really interesting. And I have a small data set, mind you, just a month and a half. Uh, it's been interesting to see how demographics break down with uh, which tour people choose. I'm finding that every single black visitor who takes my tour chooses the black history tour. And a few non-black people take the black history tour, but really only a few. Uh, white tourists are almost exclusively choosing the women's history tour or that hidden histories tour. And it's been really interesting to giving that black history tour to black tourists who have told me more of more than one of them have told me, had I not taken your tour, had I just arrived in town and walked around, maybe even taken some of the other tours, I might have just left thinking, oh, this is a white place. Like it looks white, it feels white. It's always probably always been a white place. And sure, the black population in Portland has always been fairly small and yet it runs so deep that there is so much history here. Um, that so much so that the first time I did that black history tour as a test run for friends, it ran three hours and I had to shrink it down to two, which was a hard, hard job because what do you cut? It was so, all of it's so interesting. Uh, but that's sort of a, a peek into like, who's been taking the tours and, uh, oh, you asked about questions. Um, I'd say the most interesting questions and conversations that I've had with people have been on that black history tour, especially uh, black tourists who then get into, well, we'll talk about people on this tour who have mixed race ancestry, some of whom are labeled as black or own a black identity. Other ones are passing as white um, and maybe uh, own a white identity or just use it, um, their, their uh, uh, color appearance to achieve certain goals. And people are taking this tour and they're saying, wow, that we might be talking about somebody who lived 200 years ago, and yet this sounds so relevant to me now. Uh, and I'm talking for them, the people who are like, you know, maybe they're lighter skinned and they're like, I'm often perceived as white. I'm not, I'm a black person. So we get into these kinds of conversations that normally you don't get into with somebody you just met 60 minutes ago. I don't normally walk up to people and say, hi, you look like you're from a different racial background. Could you tell me about your experience with race in this country? You know, and yet one hour in, we're having these conversations because we're able to collaboratively create this safe space for talking about stuff that everybody is like impacted by, but we have so little experience talking about. It. And that's really interesting. An Indian tourist who came here and said, it's really interesting to hear about uh, the way the, the way Americans think about race over time and how that's impacted these people's lives, these people's lives. And she was saying, uh, you know, I'm from the highest 
caste in India. My husband's from a high caste, but not the same caste. And so that's really controversial. And she wanted to talk to me about the nature of the caste system and how that is similar to or different from the race caste system that we have in the United States, even though we don't call it a caste system in very many ways, it sounds very much like one. Um, that's been really interesting. This is fascinating. I, I've now decided that not only do I want to take all three tours, but I want to take them every time you offer them because it sounds like you have so many fascinating conversations. And and I'm also thinking now about, you know, I just the act of walking and talking. There's something different than than sitting down, right? You've got that sort of physical experience that you're sharing together too. That's a different kind of learning. There's a certain magic to hearing a story at the place where it took place. Like hearing an underground railroad story, hearing the story of somebody who managed to escape themselves, like bring themselves out of slavery. And that path took them through Portland and up a certain set of stairs. These are the same granite blocks that those people walked up, you know, on their path to freedom. Um, and we're standing on there now learning the story, looking, uh, I carry around pictures. So we're really looking at a picture of them. We're standing on those stairs. Uh, there's something really impactful to that that you, you can't get from a book or a Zoom presentation or something. And, and I'm curious too, because on the one hand, I want you to write it all down and I want to read every book, but I also think you would lose something in that compared to the tour. So are you, are you thinking about adding tours and, you know, I'm, can, can we do two black history tours? So you don't have to go back to all the stuff that had to get cut. Uh, you just must be constantly having new ideas about based on people's reactions and questions. That is, that is very much true. Um, two ideas that, that my wife and I have in the hopper, because she, even though I'm the only one doing the tours, uh, she's very much co-owner and uh, the graphic designer, the web designer, and, uh, and helps help me cook uh, pretty much all the stuff that we're presenting. She has brought me two more challenges, because she's the only reason why I even consider doing a Black History Tour or a Women's History Tour. These were challenges from her. Can you do this? My first reaction being, I don't know if I have enough black history in Portland, you know, is there enough, you know, and then it turns out there's plenty. I just had to do the research. Um, she also has said, what if you do another tour and then it's an adults only tour. And that's where you get into like maybe the weirder stuff where, you know, it's more like a stand up comedy routine. <laughs> the gloves are off and you're just saying whatever. Um, I mean, true facts, not you're saying whatever, but you know, you don't have to really package it nice and clean <laughs> for families or whatever. The Portland uh, so after hours cool. tour. I like it. <laughs> yeah, totally. Uh, the other one would be more of like a, a gamified history tour. Maybe it was like a team building exercise for um, uh, maybe for corporate groups or families or something where it would be something like, I'm going to tell you three different stories that might have happened on this spot. And I want you all to try to figure out which of the three stories are true. And there's so many crazy stories that it could be hard to figure out which is the real one. <laughs> so those are some of the things that are kind of in the hopper. But that probably is incredible. Like well, please, please give a big um, congratulations and thank you to your wife on behalf of all of us. Uh, the website is beautiful. I love the graphic design and I can't wait for you to follow through on some of those challenges so that we can, uh, can take the next amazing tour. Uh, Dugan, this has been just fabulous. Just one of the most engaging lunch and learns that, that we have, have had. And I cannot wait to, to walk the streets of Portland with you and to hear the stories where they actually happened. Um, what an incredible gift. Just so you all know, um, everybody's favorite, uh, favorite behind the scenes lunch and learn person, Will Sedlak, is the, took, the, took one of your tours, Dugan, and said, oh my gosh, we have got to share this with our, our Lunch and Learn audience. So if you are all out there in the world and you have incredible experiences that you want to share with this group, you know where to find us. Please let us know um, what an incredible, incredible success. Uh, I hope you will all join us next week. We just 
talking about going behind the, the curtain a little bit, we planned this, what is going on at the Supreme Court Lunch and Learn, which we're collaborating with Planned Parenthood of, of Northern New England on. We planned it ages ago. I wish it didn't feel so incredibly relevant and urgent right now, but at the same time, I am so grateful that James Ramoser, who's the editor of SCOTUS blog um, and, and was with us for a program last year, he will be with us again next week. And uh, I've got a few questions to ask him. I have a feeling you all do too. So you will, in that follow-up email this afternoon, you'll also find a registration link. Dugan, a million thanks. It is a beautiful day out there. If you are close to Portland, go, go run around right now and find some of these sites in person and otherwise just have a wonderful, wonderful weekend. Thank you, Dugan, and thanks to all of you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm gonna run out and do a tour. So uh, I really Perfect. appreciate you uh, having me in for this afternoon. Have fun. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Yay.